Welcome to the Extraction Point. This is where we turn data into action. We've been briefed and have analyzed all the information flow. Now it's time to make sense of it all. I'm John Furrier, and today on the Extraction Point, we're going to find the Extraction Point in mobile. Is it the software or the platform that matters? The tech bubble frenzy, fear and panic. LA Times wrote a story this Sunday, shows that the writer is really not looking at the right data. He's wondering if all the big valuations in tech are a return to the insanity of the bubble. I'll tell you why he's right and wrong. We have some HP exclusive insight into the recent acquisition of Vertica. And analytics infrastructure is the big play and what that means for HP in the market. And Apple taking 30% from publishers in their new in-app store subscription model. Does that mean higher prices for readers? We'll look at all the signal coming out of Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. And we have a guest from Roku, Brian Jacquet, talking about the data and video. Let's get to the data. I'm John Furrier, and this is your Extraction Point. Okay, we're here with uh, Brian from Roku. Welcome to uh, Extraction Point. Prepare so, uh, for the Extraction jump right Point. In, um, We've been briefed on all the important stories and events in the world of emerging is information. Software is the now, it's time to extract the data about, uh, and turn it into Apple action. And Android. Live what from the SiliconANGLE studios and, uh, in the heart. Is it, is it going to be a big debate out there? What do you think about that? Well, I, th I think platform is very important. I mean, we see the same thing on, on Roku's side. Uh, having a platform for the distribution of content, uh, basically a way, an easy way for content to come down to these devices. You're seeing smartphones are, are just so rich now in their capabilities that uh, uh, software is important in, in apps and those types of things, but at the same time, you know, great example today, uh, OnLive and HTC announcing a partnership to bring the online gaming platform straight to a tablet or a handheld device. And, and that's just, that's a really powerful platform message that's being delivered from the cloud. Yeah, and then there's also the big software message. I mean, Apple has that, you know, closed platform. Android has the open platform. And that's the big thing. What makes the mobile king these days? Is it the software or the platform? And Android seems to be pushing the platform play, and uh, the developers who know cross-platform seem right. to be the winners. And the question is, can Android carry that over for them? Well, I think that, that, that the open platform that Android has is very, very uh, enticing to... Uh, to publishers, uh, to content owners, content creators, because they can basically take their, their content and spread it across multiple devices, whether it be tablets, whether it be uh, smartphones, and even obviously their, their foray into Google TV and, and trying to bring that same content to the television. Yeah, I mean, I think the big extraction point for mobile, in my opinion, is the fact that, you know, all the talk from CES in January, now recently in, in Barcelona with Mobile World Congress, is the tablet craze. And that really points to two different approaches, Apple versus Google. And that's Apple, closed system, versus Android, the open system. And really the developers who can program cross-platform will be the big winners, and we'll have to see what shakes out, the, the closed Apple or open Android. Um, I still believe that the key thing is going to be Apple right now. Apple just seems to have a great user experience. Um, some people have been telling me privately that Android's numbers are a bit overinflated due to the China market. Um, I think that's a key extraction point. If that's the case, then most of the market data in mobile is, is really overblown for in, in favor of Android. So my extraction point is, is Apple still in the lead. Android's far behind. And that even goes further today at Mobile World Congress where Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, said to, to the crowd, yeah, that they'd love to see Nokia on Android rather than going with Microsoft. To me, that still tells me that they still want to make a play for Nokia. So that's the extraction point for mobile. It's hot. Everyone wants mobile. Everyone wants a smartphone. And uh, that's what you need to pay attention to. I'd stay with Apple for now. Android's still got a lot of work to do. Uh, and that's my extraction point on mobile. So the next, next extraction point is the tech bubble. So you've been following the uh, tech bubble frenzy going on in the past couple of weeks? Hey, who hasn't, right? <laughs> you know, Silicon Valley is uh, hot. Yeah. It, seems, it remains to be you know, the, the, the hub for all, all things tech. So Michael Hitz, Hitzlick, I think his name is, on the Sunday LA Times. I don't know him very well, but apparently he wrote this crazy article, and uh, I totally disagree with him and need to call him out on it. He really doesn't, doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, it's the typical fear-mongering, oh, we're living in a bubble, Silicon Valley. I will say that you know, it's very bubblish, and I wrote a post that you know, there is a bubble, but it's not a bubble. There's two kinds of bubbles. There's the dot-com bubble that we all are familiar with right. that just completely imploded and carnage everywhere, and it was, it was horrible. I mean, we're seeing some big brands out here. He talked about Facebook, Groupon. 
Um, and I wrote the post and said that, you know, the extraction point for this is simply these big new mega franchises are making money. So I think they're worthy of that kind of valuation. When you see Twitter, for example, having massive valuations, I mean, what other company can throw a government into freedom? literally overnight. That's Facebook and Twitter. To me, that's a serious valuation. Unconventional metrics to value that, okay, I think they deserve it. Zynga, they're printing money. Groupon, printing money. Unlike the dot-com bubble, right. nobody was making any money. Right, um, but, but, but you know, the, the, it's, it's interesting. The dot-com bubble obviously uh, harnessed the internet to create all these companies. Uh, they didn't make any money, but at the same time, all that, uh, all that was created in the dot-com bubble is actually now being used. Yeah. Uh, by these these new generation of companies, like you mentioned, yeah. to create uh, you know to create money, to create value, uh, and actually to provide services to customers as well. Yeah, I mean, everything about the dot com bubble that was overhyped actually right. happened. Right. Not at the, at the invest at the revenue level. So you know it, it did happen. But I think you know today's bubble is is a real bubble and worthy of the valuations. The problem I see is when you see Quora companies like Quora who, who rarely have come out of the womb in, in, in terms of a startup getting kind of valuation is kind of insane. So I think the carnage is going to be at that kind of entrepreneurial level where a little bit over and over expectations. Um, but, but from your standpoint, you know, Roku is the kind of company that's pioneering right. uh, new business models. And most people think of video to the living room. You guys yeah. are a, a pioneer in that. Um, they think of Netflix, right? Obviously the poster child for yep. this new model. Yep. Uh, you guys are right there kicking butt. Um, as a pioneer, you're constantly facing this valuation question. How do you address that being a new force in this new model? Well, I think that, that it, it goes back to, you know, your, your, your message about, about dot-com bubbles. I mean, we make, uh, you know, Roku makes a, a piece of hardware. Uh, we sell it on the market. Um, you know, we have com competitors that are, are pure software plays that um, allow you to, to download uh, that, uh, you know, that client, and, and, uh, but there's no, there's no transaction involved. And so we've sold over a million uh, units, uh, well past a million units. We we passed it in 2010. Uh, we you know we look at it as as hey look we've created this this hardware platform for content owners and content distributors to deliver and monetize their content on our platform. Uh, companies like Netflix are very very important to us. That's how Roku really was started um, as as a company as this company uh, today. Um, but uh, the 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 goal here is to build a platform for monetization of content and we're doing it um, by the books you know we're working with the content owners. it's a real we're, business I yeah, mean you guys you guys have a real business but you're also doing things that quite frankly are not conventional wisdom so all this bubble talk about you know how do you compare a company like Facebook with right. you know 600 million users and growing and going on a tear and Zynga and Netflix now and you guys I mean the, the new user expectations are such that these kinds of franchises are developing, and it's real business. Yeah, and, and, and what you're seeing then is like, you know, a company like Netflix basically challenges the traditional way of, of getting entertainment. Blockbuster uh, has to, to basically uh, change their model to try to compete. Um, other companies, uh, other, you know, other, other companies like Amazon uh, bring in an, a, a VOD service as well to compete. So, you, I mean, you're seeing this, this disruption in the kind of the way that, that content is delivered. And that really has a lot to do with, with a company like Netflix, um, who's built a amazing business uh, that first started with DVD delivery and now is obviously uh, streaming uh, with DVDs as, as well. I'm John Furrier. We're on the ext uh, extraction point with Jay, uh, um, Brian, Jay Quit. Thanks for coming on. And you're sure. from Roku. So, so tell us about the, uh, the paradigm of uh, new media. Um, how do you guys, with all the bubble talk and... and, and the real business that you're creating. What's different about the environment right now than it was, say, you know, even seven years ago, five years ago? I mean, when companies like, you know, TiVo are out there pi trying to pioneer kind of yeah. the DVR concept. So much has changed. Internet access has changed. What's different now that's really enabling you guys to be a real business and not, and to kind of sway those bubble sayers, you know, off the, off the, uh, the rhetoric? Ledge. Well, Ro I, I should I should clarify. Roku actually was founded in 2002 as a as an audio uh, uh, pictures and audio streaming type of devices had had a SoundBridge product and a PhotoBridge product early on, and it wasn't until uh, 2008 that the the Roku player that that everyone knows today came on the market as a Netflix product. Um, I I think that that what we're seeing is uh, you know companies like Roku are taking the the, the tact of 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 Hey, look, we can make an affordable product, but 
it has to be really easy to use. Uh, anyone uh, can has to be able to install it and use it. Uh, there has to be wireless built into it so they can connect it to their network. Um, broadband speeds obviously are, are increasing dramatically, uh, and and this whole notion of streaming seven years ago was was you know there was nothing there. Like you know the DVR, uh, which our CEO Anthony Wood basically founded at Replay TV, was the way to basically download to disc and then play off a disc. Now obviously the hype is is all about streaming, and that requires uh, you know the cloud computing bringing the content down. Um, subscription services, on-demand services, you can start now inserting ads into the stream in real time to allow content owners to monetize uh, that way as well. And so our goal here in this whole thing is basically building this platform, this really seamless platform that allows uh, easy um, entry into our, into our ecosystem and also the, the ability to monetize. And I think that we've, we've helped a lot of companies in a, in a short amount of time uh, start to be successful with, with online video. A lot of people were saying that um, the costs of Boxy's momentum, their, their cost and their stumbling, they had a little stumble. Um, how has that affected you guys? Well, I think that, that look at the, the, I mean, Boxy and Roku take very, very different, uh, you know, different basically uh, points of entry into this market. Boxy created a, a piece of software that aggregates content from all these different sources. Roku made a piece of hardware. So right off the bat, we started selling that hardware. We, we make money off of that hardware. We start to build in subscription services. Um, Boxy, I think, found that it's very really difficult to create uh, a platform for the delivery of, of content to the television through hardware. They uh, are basically saying, hey, we want the Boxy user interface on a lot of different devices, and uh, we're going to basically work with D-Link and with iOmega and with uh, these other partners that they've announced. Uh, it took a long time for them to deliver the first product, the Boxy Box, and I think they went through some growing pains in that, and they're obviously out now, but um, we, we kind of take the tack that, hey, look, it's good to own both the software and the hardware because it's not easy to make a really great experience with online video for the, for the television, and uh, you know I think it takes a lot of work, and uh, these other companies are finding that that out right now. Um, what do you think the uh, the content market's like right now? Obviously, we've been talking uh, in Silicon Angle about um, the Huffington Post and uh, AOL and mm -hmm. the whole search focus. We're going to have Rick Strenta on from Blecko on uh, on Thursday, and uh, he's going to address the whole content farm thing. And they just cut a deal today with. Um, uh, Stack Overflow. So there's a big movement towards what has become a content business for yeah. Google. Yeah. And you guys are obviously in a different a different business when you're streaming high quality to the average Joe, six pack out there, who wants good content. Right. Has the content market gotten dumbed down and um, has it affected video? What's your trends forecasts on vi on video talk about content? Good, well, bad, ugly? Well, I think that I think that what we've realized is that that people will pay for good content and that the, the services and the, and the, you know, we call them channels on our platform that are successful are delivering great content and great value. Um, you know, Netflix proved with their streaming service that the back catalog was actually really, really compelling. People like to watch TV shows. They're willing to pay seven, eight bucks, ten bucks a month to watch, uh, you know, uh, movies that maybe aren't, you know, new releases. Um, but and then at the same time, you know, we have Hulu Plus on our platform, which is seven ninety nine a month, which is day after broadcast, and they just added new content from Viacom with The Daily Show and Colbert and a bunch of stuff from MTV and, and, and places like that. And so people are saying, look, I'm gonna, I'll buy the box or I'll buy this service, I'll buy this Blu-ray player if it's got great content and I'll, and I'll pay for it. Um, I, I think what you're going to see is, is there'll be some hashing out of... Uh, uh, you know, hey, if I'm paying a subscription service, do I need to also be watching commercials? And, uh, or, or am, you know, what, at what rate am I willing to actually, you know, kind of pay for a subscription and also be able to, you know, stomach uh, 30 seconds here, 45 seconds there? But, I mean, I think that, that the, the market for content is, is, is very ripe, but it has to be good quality. And that goes for, you know, movies and television shows as well as live sports, 
uh, international content. Uh, actually, a perfect example here is that we made available on our platform the Al Jazeera English live stream uh, a, a couple weeks ago, about a week and a half ago, um, through a, a video um, channel called a news channel called Roku Newscaster. And it, it went through the charts. Uh, people just are hungry for that kind of yeah. experience, and they love watching it on the television. And so uh, that, was, that was really, really great. And, and you know, obviously, we, we're getting pretty good numbers from SiliconANGLE TV and, and our, um, the Cube operation when we go to events at Strata. We had 1.2 million views in two days, yeah. 500,000 views live, and 500,000 on demand, which, which really shows half the views were live and right. half were like, Discovery. Right. Um, so there's a massive content market. You know, people are starved for content. Yeah. Um, so that's clear. Uh, the question that comes up is, you know, search has never cracked the code on video. Yeah. There's always been that, yep. you know, search is text and Google has kind of owned that market. Um, and there's just a graveyard of dead bodies of people trying to do video search. Yeah. So how do you guys address the whole discovery? Is it, is it going to be a program guide? Um, I saw some, everything's got this cool iTunes, Apple apps, you know, iPhone, yeah. iPad apps is yeah. the, is the new control of the iPad. And, it, it might, you know, that's, a, that's a great point. It might be, I mean, it, we've seen that as well. You know, there's some Roku remotes out there for iPhone and for Android and, and uh, we've been talking to another company about this iPad app that they're working on as well. I mean, the idea that you can basically search and discover on the tablet and then fling maybe the content up to the TV, I think is, is pretty compelling for some people. I mean, that's what Steve Jobs is, to a certain degree, is envisioning with AirPlay, uh, is, you know, hey, find it on your iPhone or on your tablet and, and then throw it up to the TV. Uh, search and discovery, I think, are, are two huge challenges. And it's not only discovery within a certain, you know, content channel, it's discovery across uh, different channels. So if I say, you know, I want to watch Lost, I want to be able to easily figure out where I can watch that. Can I watch it on live linear TV? Can I watch it on on demand on Netflix? Can I watch it on Am Amazon Video on demand? What is the um, you know what is the usage model? And I think that that's that's going to continue to be uh, challenging. We uh, do a good job of allowing search within our content partners, but we haven't addressed um, search across the content partners. And so you're going to have like a program guide kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, you know, the idea, and I think the challenge here is just being able to basically use it, use it, the landscape of the television to allow for content to bubble up and maybe, I mean, you see it within, within a Netflix experience already, where if you rate things uh, on the desktop experience, then it shows up within your uh, Netflix channel on Roku, you know, movies that you might like, movies that, that are, you know, based on this, movies that are based on that, and so you can easily navigate. It's very visual. You see big cover art on, on the screen. You can navigate with the, the you know, the five-piece remote that we offer. Um, so I think you'll see more along those lines as well. Okay, so we're going to jump into uh, other news today. Some other big news on the... Uh uh, that we got some exclusive uh, insight on was the HP buying uh, Vertica acquisition. Um, and I asked HP, talked to some people uh, off the record, talked to HP um, on the record. They had a few comments. They wouldn't tell us how much they paid for the acquisition, but apparently HP bought Vertica, Bill Rick, a mass company, for an undisclosed amount of money. They did say um, that it wasn't material from a financial standpoint to report, which means they won't tell, and it's too low. It's not a big number. But it also it speaks volumes about HP. HP's analytics strategy is changing. Their new CEO is on board. He's from SAP, gets software. So this is an interesting uh, gesture from HP, an actual purchase, because it forces them to execute the enterprise analytics play, which really is not about data warehousing. It's about uh, uh, in analytics as a platform. So information management is a key market for HP. This has forced them to execute. Um, HP considers Vertica to be a leading technology-enabled real-time business analytics. Um, they see the acquisition of 300 customers in real time as a key value, and obviously that's the customer. But really, it, it forces HP to sunset their NeoView product, um, and uh, they won't tell us how much they paid for it. And, and the big question I asked was, will they be sold through HP channels? And they said uh, really no comment there, and that they did also did not comment that they would sell an appliance. So, mm -hmm. as you know, the, in the Oracle market, appliances are hot. HP would be very uh, hard-pressed not to sell an appliance. So, um, that's that, and uh, HP is going to be forced to deal with that. Dave Vellante, researcher at Wikibon, had some interesting comments. I'll read them here. Uh, Dave felt that the business angle was uh, 
There's been a run on next-gen database companies. HP claims it is number six worldwide in the software space. Uh, this is woeful, and Leo clearly has an agenda to beef up HP software IP. The market angle for HP is a critical piece of uh, IP that will allow them to integrate its hardware and compete with Oracle. So that's ultimately the real tech angle is going after the, you know, the bundled uh, IP with hardware. I think that's going to be something that's going to come from, uh, from HP. And also, Vertica has also pushed databases into VMware, and, and that's going to be also the virtualization play. So, you know, HP um, is going to have to figure that out, and, uh, you know, that's kind of the enterprise news that we get, we're close to on the yeah. cloud side is uh, this business analytics. Um, but, you know, the data is a hot market. Big data and information analytics is one of the hottest topics, and we've had on the, the Cube and here on SiliconANGLE TV, um, ClickFox CEO, um, uh, Marco Pacelli talking about data, and I don't know if you have you heard of ClickFox at all. I've not heard. Of um, they're a company in New York, and they basically mine the big data from all these consumer companies okay. like Sprint right. and, and folks have huge call centers, right. and they basically look for DNA patterns of consumer behavior, <laughs> and can show a customer experience throughout multiple dimensions. Uh -huh and then provide that feedback. So wow. they're the only company on the web that I've found that are actually mining data analytics and kind of developing with it right. versus this big old data warehouse. So you know, the extraction point for that HP announcement is pretty, pretty important, even though it's kind of boring enterprise kind of stuff, is that the data warehouse model, which was once this fenced off, closed operation, now is really prime time for developers. And you're seeing the smartest developers actually leveraging the data to do that. And obviously we're at Cloudera here, the home of Hadoop, um, we're the home of big data, so that's a big trend, and we're watching that pretty closely. Well, I know. I mean, we we survey and we mine data from our customer base all the time. It gives us so much information about the things that we're doing well, the things that we're not doing well, and 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 really guides us. Uh, I mean, we're we're a very data data hungry company, and actually use that a lot in our everyday development and and design of our products and and our services. So I think that I mean. Uh, understanding customer data is, is what do you say to the folks out there that that haven't unlocked the, the data mining side of it I mean really unlocked it and they you know, everyone says hey we got data but sometimes it just sits around kind of not really doing anything well I, I think I think that the people just they do it to kind of make themselves feel like they're maybe on the right path to something instead of actually using it so I would I would urge people to actually to actually use it I mean it's 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 the best information you get in in real time to understand uh, the things that you need to improve on, uh, both in the current products as well as in future products and, and help you guide it yourself. So, I mean, I think that uh, data is critically important in, in this day and age, no doubt about it. And finally, uh, today we're going to talk about um, a big data point out there that we're going to extract some insight into, and that is the Apple's 30% cut of uh, subscriptions in their app store. So the Apple announced today the in-app uh, in store subscription model for magazines, newspapers, music, and videos, and their cut is going to be 30%. So the question is, will that mean higher prices? Mm -hmm. And does Apple have the muscle to pull that off? I mean, obviously they do. They're huge. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, that's big. That's pretty big. It's very big. Um, and I think that uh, they obviously, I think I read the release, so it's, they're taking a cue from the, the daily model that they just recently introduced with, with News Corp and, um, and using it across uh, different partners. I mean, it shows the breadth of their platform. It, look, the reality is, is they have uh, uh, devices across mobile and tablet uh, and, and desktop that span millions and millions of customers. And to uh, be able to take a, a subscription service and, and to put it on that platform and, and blast it across, you're going to get instant access to millions of customers. And so I think that that's the leveraging point they are going to yeah. be taking advantage of right now. My last company, I started a podcasting company called PodTech, and we were hot in podcasting. And you know, we were very bullish on, mm -hmm. on media and, and business. And obviously they had iTunes was just right. you know, hitting the stride. And, and so Apple was revolutionizing the music business, which had an existing business model. And their, their pricing set the stage for that kind of revolution. But they never monetized podcasts, which put my company out of business, Evan Williams' company out of business, which then he did Twitter. Yeah. Um, I did SiliconANGLE, some, some turnaround. He did Twitter, I did SiliconANGLE. <laughs> um, and then Podshow, which was Adam and Curry. Um, and so you know, basically, by not monetizing the podcasting business, he killed it. Yeah, and so the independents kind of died, and all the big guys were recycling their content on podcasting. So this is really the first time that Apple, from the ground up, is actually going to monetize new forms of media. Right. So the question is, will it take? 
And will people just tack on a 30% surcharge for the massive amounts of distribution? Because, you know, back in the day when I was doing the podcast, and be like, wow, if they charge for podcasts, we could make a shitload of money. Yeah. Right? So now, if I got a publication, right. I want to compete with Rupert Murdoch, and I have good content. Right. Well, I mean, I, just, I, I, why not pay Apple 30% cut? Yeah, I mean, I think it's that, better that, than getting making zero and going out of business, right? I think that, that the, What's the your angle on that. Well, the, I think the angle, my angle is that, that, that those that have subscription services already have to make the, that decision, have to understand kind of how that is going to affect them. A new publisher of content, whether they have music, whether they have video, what have you, um, it's just like they made an app for the app store and charged a buck fifty for it or two bucks or whatever for it. Uh, it to me, that sounds like a no brainer. It's, it's where this has an impact is for those that already have existing subscription models that are basically in the platform already that are making applications for iOS or, or what have you and, um, and how they might be impacted for anything that's new. Uh, it seems like a you know a small price to pay to get mass distribution. Uh, you know, from our perspective, Roku, we actually have a paid apps platform that we um, that we rolled out in, in January on our on our product as well. So now, you know, it, before basically you had a subscription to Netflix and then you linked to your account. You had a subscription to Hulu Plus. You had a link to your account. You had a s subscription to MLB.tv, NHL Game Center. Amazon Video On Demand, you linked your account and then the billing all went through those different individuals. Um, we actually have a way now though for publishers to publish a, a paid app, whether it be a subscription service or a one-time fee on the Roku platform. And now a, a Roku customer puts a credit card against their Roku account when they first uh, uh, buy the, the Roku product and then can do a one-click to buy a game, a puzzle, uh, uh, we have, um, you know, 20 uh, the, of these really nice videos, uh, nature videos and, and uh, unbelievable videos that, that cost, you know, 20 mm -hmm. bucks or something like that. Um, and then even more importantly, we have a, a, a cable channel on there now, Wealth TV. It's a smaller cable channel, but they charge two ninety nine a month and you get the live linear television feed that you would get as if you were a Fios customer or what have you. Plus, you get a full on demand uh, library and there's a lot of 3D content. So we take, but we take a cut as well of all those transactions. You have to be in business. I mean, you gotta yeah, get a little absolutely. distribution fee for that, right? But, but for, for, smaller, for smaller publishers of content, um, and even for some of the bigger ones, the convenience of going through our platform, for example, rather than basically having their own platform and making the customer go off to another website and, and figure it out and subscribe and then you know, turn it on the back end, um, it's much more convenient. It's much more. Uh, it's, it's it's a much lower barrier uh, to entry for you know less friction for the the customer as well as for the uh, publisher. And I think it's it's a good thing. Talk about some of your distribution and and with Roku. I mean, you guys are doing pretty well. Any highlights you want to share with the folks out there? Well, from a pure, pure numbers perspective, yeah, just yeah, any yeah. any kind of you know inside the numbers, yeah. you know, spirit at ESPN. You well, know. we 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 um. You know, we, we surpassed a million uh, units sold in, uh, in late 2010, uh, which is a, it was a big milestone for us as a, as a company. Um, but more importantly, actually, there's a couple stats I'd like to, to highlight. One is that we've served over a billion streams of content. So every time a movie gets streamed, a TV show, music, et cetera, um, those are streams. And we've, we're over a billion served, as, I, as we say. Um, but even, even like more incredible is that in, in uh, December, we saw that Roku customers were actually using their Roku uh, product uh, to watch movies, uh, TV shows, listen to music, et cetera, for over 11 hours per week. The national average for a cable subscriber of viewing is, is just over 36 hours. So we were accounting for over um, uh, just under a third of, uh, of, of the viewing on, on our platform. Um, which I think is uh, a testament to the growing popularity of Roku, but also the growing popularity of streaming and on-demand, you know, delivery of content to the television. People are using these these t these types of devices, whether they be Roku, whether they be Blu-ray players, connected TVs, et cetera, to consume content, and that's both on-demand content as well as live content. And I think that's that's pretty important. 
We're here with Brian Jaquit of Roku, and talking about uh, online video, big day. They were talking about all the extraction points in today's news and the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE. Um, you know, talk about some of the, the different types of content you mentioned, obviously right. the different variety. Um, obviously you have a kind of a long tail distribution or different yeah. variety of content from, uh, you know, churches uh, sessions in Florida um, to, uh, you know, big, pirated stuff or, you know, governments being overthrown from in Egypt, et cetera. So how, first question is, how important is local live content to you guys? Yeah. And are you seeing any demand or um, uh, uptick in, in people interfacing on the live, local? You had some successes with things from church to local events. And well, I think, I think local and live is going to be big in, in 2011. I think that, uh, that news has always been one of those touch points that, that people are, are really hungry for, and whether it be national news um, but more importantly, local news. Uh, you, you're seeing that with this channel called Roku Newscaster, which is just an aggregation of, of video podcasts and live feeds from whether it be NBC, ABC, Fox, CNN, Al Jazeera, English, uh, as I mentioned, uh, all aggregated in one. And you can basically watch the NBC Nightly News about oh, a, a couple hours after it airs uh, nationally on the, on the East Coast on, on your Roku. Uh, but but live is, is really important, and that's live local, live events, as well as live sports. Um, we have over 150 channels uh, on our platform now, uh, and international is also a really, really big piece. Uh, there's a lot of, of, of Indian television. Uh, we, we're streaming cricket, the Cricket World Cup uh, that's, that's coming upcoming. Um, a lot of expats are, are basically using our product to yeah. to bring that content into their living room, and, and and basically they turn it on and they let it run for hours, uh, and so they're consuming uh, a lot of that content on a daily basis. But uh, you know, the big guns that, that we've talked about during the course of this, of, of this show, you know, Netflix and Amazon Video on Demand and Hulu Plus are very very important sports leagues like. NHL and MLB.TV, uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship, which is uh, live pay-per-view uh, Ultimate Fighting. So, uh, you know, I think that, that we're seeing, um, and, and as you mentioned, the church, I mean, this is, uh, we have a whole category in our Roku channel store for spirituality, and there are a, a number of churches uh, that are streaming their local yeah. uh, Sunday services onto our platform live, and then also they're complementing that again with yeah a full complement of on-demand on uh, uh, content as well. And I think that's the power of, of these types of products and these platforms. And I mentioned earlier with Wealth TV, you have the live linear feed complemented by a full on-demand library, something you, you cannot do through traditional cable and satellite uh, services. Yeah, and I think that's the power of the Internet that's so, mm -hmm. so amazing right now is you can have that kind of mix. It's not your standard cable. In a way, it's like cable back in, you know, when cable evolved, right. except now there's no scarcity of channels. You could have cricket in your living room. Yeah. You could have, you know, whatever spirituality you want anytime right. on demand. Right. Um, let's talk about the media block out of, you know, Egypt and the whole Internet. You know, um, you know I was saying on Twitter, this was the modern day martial law. Mm -hmm. at a global scale. I mean, the internet being shut down, um, government basically trying to shut down any kind of liberation via the internet. Right. You guys were a big part of having that channel up on Roku. And, and, and tell us some insight into how that all happened. Yeah, yeah actually, I mean, it's, it's... Can you share just some color around it, what happened, and what, what was it like? How did yeah. it feel? I mean, look at the outcome. It I mean, felt pretty good, actually. I mean, it's one of those things where you kind of looked at it, and, and it's the power of our of our platform and of explain our, to the folks out there what happened yeah. right so and what you got what your role was in that well actually one of the ways it actually happened was that we started seeing through our Twitter feeds that people were were streaming Al Jazeera English uh, through their Roku players and we were trying to figure out how they were doing it and they were doing it in a really kind of backwards way they were having to go into one of the channels that's available on our platform and actually adding the stream and then going to their computer and and, and sign up for this account and it made it really, really hard, but we were seeing it. And so we, we did some investigation, and then we found where they were pulling the stream from. And uh, I, I, I basically asked uh, one of our uh, engineers, I said, how easy would it be to actually get this stream and put it into, one of, you know, into our Roku newscaster channel, which is incredibly popular, and people know it, and it's really easy to add, and people can go in and basically start it. And so sure enough, about an hour later, uh, he said, I've been able to extract the stream. Here it is. It's there. Uh, you know, go crazy. And we then 
Uh, what was the timetable between you going, hey, you know, there's some activity going on here. So the people were tinkering yeah. just to get the yeah. stream and to so, when you so, actually so turned that on was the, the night caster. before. And then we actually turned it on by midday the following day. And, I, and what, what I thought was so fun about this was basically how fast we were able to move and how, you know, how we were able to basically see this this opportunity um, to bring information and not not for self promotion. It bring I mean it's you know, it's legit. It's legit. M- legit exactly. movement. Exactly. And you weren't alone. Facebook and Google guys uh-huh. were doing the same thing. Yeah. There was some kind of guys who rolled their sleeves and said, "Hey, you know, yeah. this is the right thing to do." Right. I mean, you saw some of the videos. I mean, you know that uh, minivan that ran over twenty one people and yeah. there was a ton of violence. Yeah. And the government trying to shut it down. I mean, this it is. It was fun. It was fun because it was just you know you you were. You were able to basically react, and then and then you know we saw overwhelming support for for this on our you know we we put it in our newsletter and we you know let our fans and our you know our our customers know about it and and I think that that um, it was a blueprint for what we might be able to do in the future as well and how we might be able to react. Uh, even faster, maybe next time. Uh, it's in the data, right? Like I mean, that. it's all about yeah. data mining. You yeah. were basically yeah. looking at the data. Mm-hmm. Um, so, time from identification was a day and a half. You said no. It's, it was. One, it was like, like identification day? was like was like a Tuesday night, and then we had the we had the channel up and and going by like Wednesday, uh, you know, midday, early afternoon. So, how does that just walk me through kind of like the play by play internally? You go, hmm, some serious <laughs> shit going on over there. You want to keep this, you, you want to make an impact. Yeah. Do you call the CEO? Does have a, is there a board meeting? Was it just pretty much streamlined? You guys uh, just said. It was pretty streamlined. We, we you know, we, we, we have a very, you know, Anthony Wood, who's our CEO, uh, is is very much a believer in this open platform. You know, we make our SDK available to anyone that wants to download it, um, as long as 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 uh, you're respective of rights and of uh, uh, you know, and you have rights to the content, and also it's it's nothing that's uh, illicit or nothing that's derogatory, hateful. Um, we basically are of the mind that that will make your your channel available. It has to work on our platform, obviously. Um, so uh, that is that's the directive, and I think that that what we what we saw was that you know there's a few of us that basically identified a, an an opportunity to to expand our our content offering and our and our distribution, and we went after it and uh, full support of the CEO and the other executive team. That's great, uh, Brian J. Quit from Roku, great pioneer. You guys are open culture. Um, any final comments to the folks out there around? Um, the data revolution, platforms, software. What are the key innovation um, trends that you see? Because you guys are kind of pioneering. You know, obviously moving to the living room involves connectivity. Right. Uh, there's a whole trend towards cord cutting, which you know we won't get into now. We can maybe do a, another segment on, but a whole other there's show. a whole other show. <laughs> and you know, we really there isn't a lot of choice on the whole consumer ba- you know bandwidth yeah. in the home. So yeah. you guys are fighting many battles on on the trend side. But are there any key things that you look at? Go. These are key mega trends that just will enable a new kind of user experience, new kind of benefits, similar to how you explained, you know, you saw some trends with the data, with what was going on in Egypt and how that just kind of came together. I mean, you guys really enabled some pretty massive change, historic change with, with Egypt. What trends do you see that will help average users, uh, you know, get a better experience with the Internet and content, et cetera? Well, I think that that w- what we're seeing is is a transformation of of the content and the availability. I mean, you know, d- there's going to be a day where basically anything that's ever been published, anything you want, anything you that you desire to to watch or listen to or consume, is going to be ripe for the picking. And I think that that platforms like Roku and there are other companies, obviously, that I think are helping from an education standpoint. You know, we haven't talked about Apple and Google in terms of of, of their forays as much into the living room, but uh, 2010 saw a huge uptake in in you know just the awareness of of these types of solutions, and I think that companies like Google and, and Apple are are to to um, you know to benefit or actually are to, to thank for things you know to, to, for creating that. Uh, even the uh, you know on the other side of it, we see the success of Netflix and basically the, that awareness that is there. For the three screens, now that you've got these mobile apps, you can you you can consume on the desktop, and then you can consume on the on the television. One subscription takes you across those three mediums. Roku plays a really integral part part in that as well, and and you can see that for Hulu Plus, 
one subscription across three different mediums. MLB.tv, one subscription across three different mediums. NHL is the same way. Uh, I, I think that what, what you're starting to see is you're starting to see content really open up. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing um, an explosion of the availability of content. And companies that were, were not as willing to kind of test the waters with their content are now coming back and saying, oh, hey, you know, Roku or, or others, you know, okay, you've got, got over a million people that are using this or that bought this product, they're using this product now. Hey, Apple, you've actually had a lot of success with your Apple TV product. We can start looking at different ways to distribute and diversify the distribution of our content across these platforms. But the key is, obviously, is, is, is can I monetize that in the right way? And what's that, what's that model? Is that model an extension of the linear experience that you're already paying for on your cable or satellite dish? Is that model an a la carte experience? You know, what's the model for, for distribution? And I think that that's, you're, you're going to see a, a few different forays into that in, in 2011. All right, I'm John Furrier, Brian uh, Pequette, the uh, Jay Quit, I'm sorry, um, from Roku. That's the extraction point. We're talking about mobile. We're talking about the internet bubble. New brands and mega brands are emerging. We're talking about uh, Mobile World Congress. And uh, that's a wrap for today. Thanks, Brian, for giving us the insight on the, into the trends in your company. And, uh, you know, as a pioneer, congratulations on all your success. And great to hear the story about uh, you know, Egypt and, and what you, you guys have done. Thank you.